We are going to introduce Mitch Dickey. What's that? Someone wants me to sit down. Hey, Mitch Dickey, why don't you come up and introduce your friend, Terry Loughran. Give Mitch a hand, guys. Good morning, guys. Uh, wasn't last night pretty amazing? I mean, can you imagine Mark standing up here and for an hour just holding forth what it was ever in his heart? I mean, to me, wow. Mark, thank you, man. And if you do it again today, man, I may get blown right out the back of the back of the room. Um, Terry Lochran. Probably knows as many guys here as anybody. And uh, that's because of a transformation that has happened in him over the last seven, eight years. And I can't imagine that uh, Terry was an easy nut for the Holy Spirit to crack. Um, You'll you'll hear part of this this morning, but uh, he grew up in a a farm in Maine, one-room schoolhouse, poor, not not an easy life, and he lived for the first part of his life kind of the American dream. Uh, He ended up uh, CEO of a sizable company, uh, having a big house, a a Maserati, a Porsche, a beautiful wife, uh, all those things that the world... What's their, our little uh, our, uh, theme song? Renowns? Reveres. Reveres. Thank you. Uh, Terry kind of did that. Not just kind of did that. He did that. And uh, a- along, the, along the way, uh, he got a little prideful. I would be if I had done those things. <laughs> that's, no, that's no skin off of any of us. And he could be a little tough. He, he was, at, you kind of knew that Terry was important. And I don't know how he communicated that. Maybe it was just years of being important. But man, the first thing you know about Terry was that he was important. And that was irritating. And I, I liked the guy. I naturally liked the guy. I love the guy now with all my heart. But he could be a little irritating. Uh, so can I. As, um, I was to him many times. And, but then something happened. I think the Holy Spirit just came down and descended on the guy like a, like a snowfall, a continuous, unrelenting snowfall. And that guy turned into uh, an incredibly generous man. Who knew one thing supremely well, and that was that it wasn't about him, it was about the Holy Spirit. And he fully surrendered and surrenders at every time he encounters a guy to be used by the Holy Spirit with no expectations. This is a guy who had a lot of expectations, who when he was in conversation with you was trying to get something out of you. Who, who competed with guys to, to be the top dog. And now he surrendered to be used by the Holy Spirit. I wish for every single one of you guys out there that you could surrender and you could be as available and you could be as able to just give as freely of whatever the Holy Spirit does as this guy does. Because you know what? You know the little parable of the mustard seed? That's Terry Loughran. My image of Terry Loughran is that, sure, there's a good base, and the seed fell on good soil, and there's a nice pot within which it is held. 
But that seed has gone this way, that seed has grown this way, that seed has grown this way. There are thousands of seeds that this guy has helped bloom and plant because he simply does whatever he hears the Holy Spirit doing. He's the same guy. It's the same person. He's now prideful about his humility. He's, he, he, it, he's the same abilities he had when he was running companies. It's just now completely in service of the Holy Spirit. Oh, I got to shut up. Um, part, part, okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm done. My good friend and servant of the Holy Spirit, Terry Lochran. <laughs> it's all yours, brother. <laughs> I don't know where to go from here. <laughs> Do I live up to or down to that introduction? Um, I got to put my glasses on so I can read my notes. I'm not that familiar with that story, but oh, it's my story. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I used to think this was my story, and I realize it's not my story. It, it truly is the Holy Spirit's story. Anyway, I grew up on a farm in Maine. Uh, the first blessing, right there. <clears throat> At age five. Uh, I was introduced to chores because I was old enough now. So at five, I was pulling weeds and I was feeding the chickens and uh, and I was doing a lot of stuff. And I a felt responsible and and b I I really had to do this stuff. So it wasn't like you know if you feel like it when you're not playing, you can go do some of these things around the farm. A great foundation. I recommend it for everybody. Uh, But that was the, the first blessing. Um, I did go, I started school in Poland Spring, Maine, where I grew up, in a two-room schoolhouse, and uh, my parents, after my first year in the school, in this two-room schoolhouse, moved us to Portland so I could get a proper education. The two rooms were, the, the bigger of the two rooms was the ninth grade through the twelfth grade smaller was kindergarten, which I was in, through the eighth grade. And one teacher taught K through eight, and one taught junior high and high school. And you sat by row, and it just worked out that all the rows seemed to be filled up, but a row was a grade. So being a curious or ADD kid, I guess, um, I listened to the teacher as she taught every grade. And uh, so consequently, I had a pretty good foundation. I went to Portland uh, because my parents wanted me to get a real education. At the end of the first week in school, I took a note home to my parents, and I thought, oh, boy, you know, I must be in trouble. I've only been here a week. And my parents read the note, and I was apparently in trouble. They were not too pleased with me. They had to go to school with me Monday morning. So uh, we all went to school and uh, went to the principal's office, and the principal starts out by saying, we have a problem here. So I figure, boy, I'm, I'm really in deep shit after one week. Uh, but I don't know why I'm telling this part of the story. But anyway, so, <clears throat> so what the principal said is we can't have Perry in the first grade. Uh, he's too advanced. So Mr. and Mrs. Lochran, do you mind if we put him in second grade? He really should be in third grade, but he's not... Uh, mature enough to be in third grade. So I, I skipped a year in school, which was wonderful. But this is just all indicative of the fact that I've really been incredibly blessed. Now, I knew as I was growing up and, and all these blessings unfold, I knew that what it was really attributable to was that I worked really hard and I was really smart, and I had great intuition, great intuition. 
It took me 68 years to understand that intuition was the Holy Spirit. And unlike a lot of guys' stories, every time I came to a fork in the road and I had a decision to make, I would go through this little exercise, which I taught lots of guys. And I would take a piece of paper like this, 8 and a half by 11. I'd fold it this way, and I'd title this side pros, this side cons. I'd write down all the pros and all the cons because I had to process this with my intellect. And then after I had done that, I would throw away the paper and go with whatever my intuition told me was the right thing to do. And, uh, you know, it, it doesn't make for a very interesting story, but I virtually always did the right thing. Thank you, intuition. Come, intuition. Uh, <laughs> Dine Sancte Spiritus. Sorry, sorry, Holy Spirit. Um, <clears throat> so growing up on a farm, I wasn't terribly socialized. I was the only kid. It was an extended family. My aunt and uncle, my grandmother, my grandfather. My father was off fighting the war. And so I was kind of the center of attention. And although I, I never really felt entitled, I was the center of attention. I mean, I had, I had things to do and I had responsibilities. So when I got out into the bigger world, I felt my, my orientation was I was very competitive. And my orientation was that other guys were an impediment between me and whatever the goal was. So I really, you know, I heard this all through my career and I thought that that's not really true. I don't know what they're talking about. But people would say, yeah, you get to the top over the broken bodies of other people. And I would say, oh, come on, that's, you know, I just, I was better than everybody else. That's how I got to the top. Well, the reality of it is I did it over the broken bodies of other people. I always felt guys were the competition. Uh, because there were women in this extended family I grew up in, I really related to women. I was more comfortable with women. Uh, and guys were to be avoided, to be not, not feared, but to be competed against and they certainly were people that you didn't want to be transparent with because I played that little game of knowledge is power. And what I know and keep from you gives me power over you because I know something you don't know. So it was, uh, looking back on it, it was pretty lonely. I never had a male friend, a real friend. There is nobody from my junior high school, high school, college, or business career who ever knew anything about me. And um, I, I'm sad about this at this point. I missed an awful lot, and I really uh, I envy people who go to their high school reunion and really have a bunch of guys that they can go out to Mexico with and hang out with and, and love on. Because I didn't love on anybody, and as far as I could tell, nobody loved on me. Um, <clears throat> I'm out of time here. I'm running down. Huh? Let me check my notes and see what, see what else happened in my life. <laughs> so I, I, I started to change a little bit. In, uh, after college, I went into the Army. And it was a, a sobering experience. I went in before the Vietnam thing happened. And I ran a training operation at Fort Gordon, Georgia. We used to call it the armpit of the southeast, the, the only building on the whole post that was, the permanent, that was a permanent building was the officers' club, of course. Everything else was a World War II wooden building and falling down. So I'm a 21-year-old second lieutenant, and I have 35 NCOs reporting to me and a couple of crusty old master sergeants. And at age 21, I've got 45-year-old guys coming in and asking me for counseling and to speak into their lives. And uh, <clears throat> my intuition was with me, thank God. So I was able, through my intuition, to apparently do some good. Uh, and that, I think, is where the mentoring thing started, where I, I got positive feedback. And I was still amazed that guys twice my age were asking me about 
their marital problems and problems with their kids. And, and I spoke into that. And, you know, now I'm, you know, I certainly understand it wasn't me, it was the Holy Spirit, but he was using me. He was using me big time, and he was protecting me. So uh, my curse or my blessing, my real curse or blessing was I grew up in a religious home. And I loved the Lord, and I was on fire for the Lord when I was a teenager. And I, uh, <clears throat> we went to a Methodist church because my father was Irish Catholic, my mother was Anglican, and it was the closest compromise we could find where they liked the preacher. So, and they had this thing in Methodist Youth Fellowship. So for all four years of high school, I was the president of that, and I was on the on the board of the church my last two years of high school as kind of the youth representative, but I was a full voting member of the council of the church, which, again, you know, my intuition served me well and I actually said some intelligent things that were of value. Um, but the truth is, I was in the MYF because that's where all the good-looking girls were. <laughs> But I got to do a service. We did a Sunday night service, which I did. I wrote the service. I selected the music. I, I did everything. I wrote the homily. I delivered the homily. And every now and then, I would let one of the good-looking girls read the scripture. But basically, I did it all. And uh, <laughs> my ego is just you know, absolutely out of control at that moment. But I want to report. I put a lot of pressure on these girls, and not a single one succumbed. So. Don't chase Methodist girls. So I went, I went off to college, and I was in love with the Lord, and I took some courses on religion, thinking maybe I really should go a little deeper here. And as, as is the case for everybody, it wasn't a unique experience. My religion course was taught by an atheist, and at the end of the year, I understood that all roads led to God, just be a good person. So, oh, okay, I don't need any more of this religion stuff, and I can go off and do my own thing. So that anchor in my life was gone. And <clears throat> when I got married, my wife and I agreed that we would raise our kids in a Christian home, which we did. The last kid left home to go to prep school. I don't think any of my kids ever went back to church. Uh, I never went back to church. During that period of time, we moved three times, and I was involved on the church vestry or leading the new roof building committee or the annual drive. And I saw the politics up close and personal, and uh, I really disliked church. And I really came to really dislike religion. I knew there was a God, um, but he was up there. And this Jesus, Holy Spirit thing, uh, yeah, I kind of got the trinity. I had no idea that Jesus lives, that the Holy Spirit was my intuition. I didn't know any of this stuff. But what happened was I was so burned on church that <clears throat> this is going to amaze you. I didn't go to church for 40 years. I'm older than I look, <laughs> or maybe, maybe I'm not. Uh, I'm, 76, I'm 76 years old. I was born again, guys, when I was 68. I was born again when I was 68. And the vessel that the Holy Spirit used was Bob Martin, who invited me to something, and I didn't know exactly what it was. And he didn't even give me a ride in his car. I had to follow him in my car, so I had no clue as to where he was going. And I ended up at Trinity Church, and the Holy Spirit met me there uh, at the door. And it was incredible. And Another blessing of my life is my wife was born again at the very same moment. And so we're absolutely on the same page. We're not really, she's a page or two ahead of me, but uh, <laughs> we're kind of on the same page. Uh, so so I, m my story is different from the standpoint, the Holy Spirit has been in my life all over me, protecting me, leading me, directing me towards something. Um, when I was born, Born again, uh, for the first six months, I was losing sleep at night thinking, oh, I'm going to have to go to divinity school. And I'm too old to you know, go to college. I can't memorize stuff anymore. And uh, I, I really thought I was going to go to divinity school. And the reason was, was Billy Graham was getting older, 
and somebody was going to have to step up and replace him. <laughs> and I knew that was going to be me. So it was, you know, I was going to convert thousands in the Yankee Stadium at a time. And uh, at the end of the six months, the Holy Spirit spoke to me very clearly. And this may be a little spooky. I got to tell you, I have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, and, and I listen. And we all do. But I listen after 40 years of being unchurched. I'm finally listening. And the, the ministry that the Holy Spirit gave me is one-on-one. -on -one. It's one-on-one. -on -one. And I've been given the great privilege, I still don't really understand it, of speaking into the lives of a lot of men, but one-on-one. -on -one. So um, it's not going to be 5,000 at a time. And that, that's what it is today. So um, I don't know how to really end this thing, but I have a thought. First what? Oh, my first love. Oh. <laughs> well, you guys are in for something absolutely incredible. Um, you know, I, I think you know that. There's nothing I can say. You saw Mark last night. By the way, Mark is going to take it so much further and deeper uh, today than he did last night that, you know, hold on to your hats. I mean, it's, it's going to be incredible. So I just want to... Um, <clears throat> Go to a couple of biblical quotes. I'm not a Bible quoter kind of guy. I learned the Bible uh, in the King James Version when I was a kid. So everything that I memorized, and it was a lot, doesn't really work anymore <laughs> because I'm trying to switch over the NIV. So and I, and I have difficulty memorizing verse. So uh, oh, yeah, I, I should go back to King James, right? Anyway, I like what Paul says in First, first Corinthians, and I think it's uh, very relevant. Chapter 12, verse 7, the Spirit has given each of us a special way of serving others. And he's certainly done that in my life, and he's done it in your life too, and I don't know whether you're listening to it or open to it, but he has. And I like this quote from Romans, which is relevant. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks, guys. Thank you.